A few years ago, I saw a discussion between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. I think it was the one where they were in London. And basically they covered, they basically went over the same ground that they famously got stuck on, on Sam Harris's Waking Up podcast. I think that's what it was called back then, where basically they were talking about the concept of what is true. And then obviously John Peterson's whole thing is it's sort of inspired by the concept of logos. You know, there's like a, a higher resolution meaning to things. Sam Harris is an extreme rationalist, except... He has that very interesting side element where he's interested in psychedelics and the ideas of consciousness and meditation, etc. So he's got a little bit of wiggle room to work there. But obviously the two were quite clashing quite a lot, not least because Sam Harris is one of those people who anytime he sees religion, mystical, he just sees like untrue. It's not factually the case. And if you allow people to think that or you agree that it's no problem, then, you know, it will lead to the greatest horrible things of all time, blah, blah. You, you get the premise. Like they're, they're both arguments that people can understand. They both have a, a seed of reason, truth in them. I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll just leave it there in that regard. It's pretty funny, right? So they get in this discussion at one point. I'm not actually sure if this is in the London one exactly in the sense that I'm going to describe now, but they've definitely had this discussion a number of times where basically they start talking, because there's always a touchstone of Jordan Peterson's work, as he did on his channel, about biblical stories. Because Jordan Peterson's perspective, basically, is he doesn't claim like a strict spiritual belief or for example belief in a real external god i mean again he would just go like you know depends what you mean by a real except you know we all know we all know his style you know he's a very interesting guy you know the way that it goes when he explains so by the way the fact that he explains in a very long way like that can be itself quite entertaining right quite interesting in itself so he obviously views things i would say on almost like a joseph campbell mythological level like you're seeking to sort of pan in the river and see what little fragments of gold you get at the end even if some of it's just you know it's just mud it's just shit whatever so to him he's essentially one of those guys we can sum it up as it didn't happen but it's true in some sense more or less. You get the premise. So when he sees biblical stories, particularly one of his favourites, I think he says it's 10 sentences long or something, is Cain and Abel, the son and son of the brothers of their first humans. He kind of sees stories like that as condensations of like a logos of brilliant, the best ideas, the highest like concepts that have been refined over years and years and years and years and years of being retold and passed through the nervous system of one person to the next to the next to the next and they've essentially drawn out this ultimate this almost super context as it was now often similar things are said or thought by people like me about the sayings of the Buddha, of Confucius, of Marcus Aurelius. Because the problem is, they've just got too many bangers, haven't they? They've got too many comments that are just absurdly poignant. Like, the way they're crafted almost looks like someone workshopped this, like, kept going and going and taking away this and taking away that and rephrasing it and making it. Same way as you see quotes online that are like, this quote isn't exactly what he said, and then the real version of what they said is, like, not quite as good a version of what someone sexed up with the quote when it's gone through a bunch of other people's nervous systems and become mimetic, as it were. So the key point of disagreement, basically, is that Sam Harris makes this bold statement that because he thinks you can just sort of read into a lot of these things, and he, quite frankly, isn't that impressed by things like the Bible and other spiritual things. He, I mean, I guess he would be with maybe some Buddhist stuff, so maybe some Zen Buddhism, but he, he actually thinks, you know, it's a bit infantile. I could, I could find books just off the shelf now written by people that are better. So he hit says, I think it's one point in time from memory, essentially, like, anyone could make up a story like that. I think referring to Cain and Nabal, or even says that he could make up a story like that, which sounds on the surface plausible if people think oh well they were more primitive and we're more advanced not something i subscribe to but the reason why if you've ever followed his work you would understand this is famously this kind of was what he alluded to in that podcast like i've actually i'll link it in the description box below i've got basically a thing where someone put a whole um transcript of him describing a scenario like that where what he does is he explains how the way you read into these things is what brings out what seems like the spiritual wisdom. So he gives an example of like a recipe. And it's literally just, you know, like two chopped shallots and five carrots and three liters of water. And then, you know, he'd go like three liters of water that represents, you know, the triune nature of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We need all three if we want to be made whole again, the essential life-giving quality. I, I'm making up my own version, but you get the point of what he was trying to say, you know. The idea is if you, you kind of like sex it up and you really go into it and you try and tie everything 
everything to this, that, the other, then you can kind of make it sound profound, right? You can make it sound wise. I don't think that's the same thing personally, necessarily that Jordan Peterson's saying, but I can see how they could sort of just be talking past each other a little bit in that regard. So they disagree, basically, because Jordan Peterson just sort of straight up says, but you can't you can't just write a story as good as this. You couldn't write one essentially that, you know, would endure, would touch as many people's lives, would have this super context to it. You know, you just couldn't do it. Like he's, to him, it's something more. Because his point is, and this is a point I think Sam Harris missed actually, it's key, it's the element that it wasn't just one person who wrote it. It's the idea that the story gets refined over and over time by multiple, multiple people. And therefore, because they're all like drawing the wisdom, the truth, whatever they see out of it, the logos, hopefully, it comes to a higher level of refinement at the end than any one person at the beginning starting that first domino could ever have actually foreseen or potentially accomplished themselves. So firstly, to a degree, Harris is right in some sense. I've always thought with a lot of great pieces of art, literature, wisdom, thinking, essentially, if you come in and you're a complete novice who knows nothing about the area, you're not going to get that much out of it. If you come in and you're very aware about it and you know the arguments they're referring to, it's like reading nature or something, you're going to get a lot more out of it. So, so that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, it's not when you read a certain book or encounter these things, or it's not if you read a certain book or encounter these things, it's when you do it. If you do it at the right time, it might key in and unlock something inside you. If you go at the wrong time, it might seem like nonsense, gibberish, might just not seem that profound, might not make sense. A bit like music. There could be a music artist. You, something about them tells you you really want to like them. Like You like this one song, something about their vibe and sort of the ethos. Of the music, but you just can't get into it. And then 10 years later, you go back, you listen to that song again, you listen to another song. You go, this is pretty good, actually. You don't, and all of a sudden, it's like, what changed? Why are they so good? Because you changed, didn't you? They stayed the same. The, the CD was still just there on the shelf, but you changed. And as a result, now you're loving it because the person who's listening now ain't the guy who listened 10 years ago, was he? Now, Peterson's background, understandably, is going to put him in a position where he can interpret in this particular way. Like, obviously, he's coming sometimes from a Jungian background and he likes Nietzsche's work and he's trying to do, obviously, he's done all this work in terms of symbology and maps of meaning and all that stuff. Now, whether or not what he is interpreting is intended or not, yeah, that's where we can get into a debate and the reply guys and debunkers are going to go, well, oh, that's not what he meant at all. You know, that, that, that guy in his time period wasn't that. Because they don't see this point whatsoever and they're just going to be trapped in a nightmare of their own fucking Corons on like just forces just tearing the mind away with pure rationality until there's nothing remaining. Nothing can ever mean anything to these people. So I would just say the point to me is I don't think it necessarily matters. To me, you can still take value out of it that wasn't intended by the author. I've always thought with song lyrics, this is like that. You can hear the interview and go, yeah, it was actually about this girl I knew, you know, and it couldn't. It's like, no, to me, it was some universal song of love and it was about the essence of a uh, the romantic love of the troubadours, the unrequited other... Like, in that scenario, he's like, no, no, it wasn't. Though. But it is to me, that's the point. That's the idea John Peterson's getting to. There's a higher truth expressed there than even you knew yourself, you little pleb guy, just in the fucking... Oh, buddy, oh, ding, 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 ding. Oh, there we go, I've done the song. Like, the point is, you bring something to it. It's all your experiences, your life. It touches certain resonances, right? And that's why it means so much to you. That's how Hollywood movies play on your feelings, your, your trauma your fucking life experiences, even though you know it's a guy faking on the screen who's not that character, it's often cheesily written with all romantic plot just crowbarred in, and the movie, you know it was just sold to sell popcorn. So despite knowing all that, and in theory it's, you know, a carnival barker, because there is an artist behind it, and because they have managed to hit certain things, if you bring the right part on your side of the equation, you take something away valuable, could make you cry could make you change your life, could make you think differently completely about things, right? We all know it. The problem I had with this whole scenario was this. Part of the reason they were talking past each other is because they kept it in this area of the Bible, which, listen, already is going to be a trigger for Sam Harris. And Jordan Peterson, to this day, does not say he is expressly like a Christian in the most literal sense. I mean, he would say, you know, it's not about literalism and that's the problem with religion and how it's interpreted. Okay, but the problem is, as a result, like, I don't think they're ever going to get to a point they could even understand each other to some degree there. Now, with that said, I think the issue is, and this is why I titled the video like this, someone tell Jordan Peterson about this example I'm about to give you about the Superman mythos because he doesn't appear to know something that is a much better, more easily understood and explained answer to the same question because with the Superman mythos, I can chart for you the timeline 
of how this same process took place in a way that we can't for the Bible, for other things. Like, yeah, you could compare in theory, like the manuscripts and the sections that are the same, but it's not the same as if you could really do like a whole chart of it started here, A, B, C, D, E, right? And this is how we got to Z at the end. And you could go, oh, well, yeah, I can see actually, yeah, but at A, it was nothing. And then at H, it was pretty much something. And then at M, it got incredible. And by the time it was U, I didn't even think it would get better than that. Z, I, it's just nothing. It's not even recognizable to the original thing. Because basically, what you'd do is this, you'd say to Sam Harris, you know the character Superman from DC Comics? He would obviously say yes, right? You would say, here's a bunch of questions for you. See if you can answer them. And I'm going to guess he's going to get most of these. You'd say, where does he live? Uh, or where did he live in his youth when he was growing up? So the answer to that one is Smallville, of course, right? Almost like every town USA. Everyone knows Smallville, right? It's a happy little place. And it's to contrast with the big city of Metropolis. So what are his powers? Well, he can fly, he can shoot lasers out of his eyes, he's invulnerable, except the kryptonite. Um, you know, all of them. All of them, yeah, could blow breath. Or so what values does he represent? Well... Truth, justice, the American way, you know, never giving up, uh, always being fair to everyone, never trying to cheat or lie, all that great shit. What is his symbol? Everyone knows the iconic Superman symbol, right? It's the S for Superman. Oh, but is it? Isn't it the House of L, his family symbol when he was on Krypton as a baby that his father had, who was the scientist, Jor-El, who was trying to save the planet, etc. Now you could ask him finally, is he a good example of a hero? Now, they might disagree on that point because maybe Sam Harris isn't in a comic. Some of you think Saron Fatal, I think Superman's too easy a character. It's a very like NPC sort of very rational materials take of like, oh, it's just too easy because he's just impossible. It's like, no, the genius is Superman is you scale up the problems so that he's taking on enormous problems and it makes it like everyday life as a result. And he obviously has people who could kill him, could trick him, could do stuff to him that he can't do. Yeah, he does it. That's like a take for people who haven't read comics if they say that. So basically, assuming you could agree on that, like, yeah, obviously he's a brilliant example of a character. He's one of the greatest examples of character. He's almost like a Greek god in some sense, the way he's presented. He has his flaws in some senses. I mean, in, in the sense that, like, he is a bit of a Boy Scout. You know, he could be tricked on some level. People obviously can cheat and he won't cheat. But, yeah, it's all how you can do it. But if you want to embody a lot of archetypes and values of a hero, one of the best, right? So I'll just say this. Grant Morrison describes it the best way. The best thing about Superman is this. Superman never gives up and he always finds a win. I don't mean always finds a way. Like, ah, oh, just eventually. It's like he'll just try everything until he eventually gets one. As long as there is a way to succeed, he will try until he gets it. He is the avatar of optimism in the face of everything. Hence, Superman's role, spoiler, at the end of Final Crisis by Grant Morrison. I won't tell you what it's about, but basically, this is kind of the, the note he hits there. The problem is this. You might think because it's a comic book character. Oh, right. Well, yes. Then haven't you just made a point against what you just said? Superman was created by two guys. Like it was mainly by a guy called Siegel, right? Guy who wrote him. It was created in, I think, 1938 when I looked it up. Problem is this. The character wasn't most of the things I was just talking about in those questions. You think he is because that's what you know through movies and modern day comics. And that's what the Superman mythos, like mythology, has evolved into. But... He wasn't able to fly at the beginning. He didn't um, come from Smallville. The newspaper wasn't called the Daily Planet. He wasn't vulnerable to kryptonite. He didn't represent the values he does now. He was a hero, but not in that like explicit way. In fact, the main writer of Superman, because he went away to war in like 1943, and then it gave over the rights to DC, which sadly led to this tragic affair where they sort of fucked him over. He didn't write him again until something like 1967. Over the years, other writers took the Superman character in universe. They changed it. Some improvements, some not improvements. I wasn't a big fan of some of the John Byrne stuff. It was almost like an 80s vibe. They improved and changed it. And what happened was when other characters came along and the people at DC who saw what they did, they sort of kept a lot of the best changes and incorporated that into the next guy's work. And so it was getting refined, 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 refined. And we call this the Superman mythos. So for example, Smallville isn't ever mentioned as where Superman grew up until Superboy number two. Superboy. Remember, Superman began in action comics. Superboy number two, author unknown. Kryptonite. That actually apparently came about from the radio serial, The Adventures of Superman, in a story called The Meteor from Krypton, broadcast in 1943. Remember, I think I said it was 1938 that they created Superman. The whole Truth, Justice, and the American Way, that was from a 1942 episode of the same serial, which was the first appearance. The idea he could fly actually came from the Fleischer 
animation films. And then they thought, right, we better do this because it's going to be weird him jumping over butt. So they made him able to fly. Him being called Kal-El as his Kryptonian name. 1957 in Superman 113. Living in the fortress of solitude at the North Pole where no one can find him. And he has to, only he can pick up that giant key to open it. And he's got all of his treasures. Of it. That was from 1958 Action Comics 241. Lex Luthor, before that, he's just called, I think he's just called Luthor before that. Lex Luthor getting his proper name, 1960, his most iconic villain and who represents like how humanity is afraid of the alien, all sorts of crazy things you can read into that. The very th fact that his symbol represents the House of L. That was from the Fleischer animation Shield with the S in, but then it developed over time. And then eventually, years and years and years later, someone said, oh, it represents like the House of L from when he was over in Krypton. I'm talking decades later, as far as I remember. So the character eventually becomes this incredible symbol of hope and optimism with this whole like mythos, just like a Greek myth, doing the right thing, truth, justice, all that good jazz. But he wasn't before. And he wouldn't have been if he'd just been left at the original story or only in the hands of his creators. There's a Grant Morrison quote about this. Basically, I'll put a video up here where he talks about how Superman is more real than we are, than Grant Morrison is. Now, he's not real. He's a character who lives on a page. But you know what? He's here before us. He's going to be here after us. He's going to live on in the imagination. He'll impact more lives and nervous systems than any of us. And so, in a sense, this very Petersonian, um, Jordan Campbell-esque sense he is more real than us, right? He's having a tangible effect on the world more so than we are, but we're supposed to be real, corporeal, material beings who can interact and knock on wood and all that good jazz, right? So no, I don't think Sam Harris could write something as meaningful to as many people's lives as the Bible or the Superman mythos. But I also think Jordan Peterson could use an example like this to make his point for him.